Hi everyone and welcome to this Enrich Education History Mini Masterclass. My name's Keith and today I'm going to be looking with you at an event that in history that really did change the world. It happened close to where we live today and you can still see lots of it, signs of it around us today. We're going to look at the railway that was built in 1830 between Liverpool and Manchester. So before we look at the railway, let's just have a think about what Britain was like in the 1830s. Um, this was just before what we call the Victorian period. Queen Victoria's reign started in 1837. So we're looking at seven years before Vict Queen Victoria's reign started. If you were a time traveler and you could go back to the 1830s, what would you see? Well, if you looked at clothes, um, Ladies, better off ladies, would have had long skirts on and long dresses. Men may have worn top hats, possibly capes. There were special clothes for children, probably quite different than the ones you're wearing today. Less well-off people. Um, women, again, would have worn long skirts, maybe shawls, possibly covering their heads. Men would have worn caps, probably had waistcoats underneath their jackets. Children would have worn very similar clothes to adults. What were the houses like? Well, the richest people, lords and ladies, for example, often live in what we now call stately homes. They were huge houses in acres of ground with armies of servants. And we can visit many of those today through things like the National Trust. Other well-to-do people, so maybe lawyers or merchants, also lived in houses that were very large by today's standards. Not quite as big as stately homes, but still very big. They also had servants to look after them. The houses in the picture were built around this time, and they're in what's called the Georgian Quarter of Liverpool. If you were a, an ordinary worker, maybe a clerk or a craftsman or one of the better off factory workers, you might have lived in this sort of house. These were built around the same time and had maybe two or three bedrooms. But families were large, remember, and you might have been sharing a bedroom with three or four other people. Can you spot two things which shows that this picture of the workers' houses is a modern one? Two things in this picture. Did you spot the TV aerial? and maybe the double yellow lines outside. Obviously no televisions in 1830 and also no cars. So you didn't need double yellow lines outside the house to stop people parking there. The poorest people lived in terrible, overcrowded, dirty and unhealthy slums. But they were, cities like Liverpool and Manchester were much smaller than they are now, but they were growing very quickly as people moved into cities from the countryside in search of work. And this created problems of overcrowding, poverty and disease. Unlike today, most people still lived in the countryside rather than cities. Travel, transport and travel. How did people get around in the 1830s? Well, if you wanted to go to other countries, it had to be by sea on sailing ships. Voyages were very long, dangerous, uncomfortable and very expensive for ordinary people. Very few people would travel overseas, and if they did, many would never return. So, for example, they'd go on one journey to emigrate to Australia. If you were travelling round Britain for longer distances, you could travel by stagecoach, by road. Again, these were expensive, and they were also slow and very uncomfortable. You can see some of the passengers sitting on the outside of the stagecoach, it was only the more expensive tickets to get your seat inside the coach. So you were open to the weather and the roads were bumpy and it would have been slow and very uncomfortable. A lot of the things that are carried in lorries today or by rail were carried by horse and cart. And you can see one in the picture there. Canals also carried lots of things such as coal, food, cloth or china. Canals were a good way of carrying things needed by the factories or things to sell in shops and markets, but they were slow. The barges were pulled by horses, as you can see in the picture. So you can see why people wanted to develop better ways to travel in the 1830s. Two other really important things that were going on in Britain in the 1830s. The Industrial Revolution. 
This was a time in Britain when there were lots of new inventions happening, new machines, new ways to make things, new types of power and energy, using coal and steam power instead of horses and windmills, and new factories and mills to make things in were springing up, instead of things being made in people's homes or little workshops. Cities and towns were growing fast as people moved in from the countryside to work in the new factories. And the British Empire. Britain was conquering or taking over countries around the world. These became British colonies. And you can see some of the darker shading on the map showing you where Britain had colonies in the 1830s. By the 1830s, Britain had colonies in North America, the West Indies, India, Australia and New Zealand. They were ruled by Britain. Britain could sell the things that were produced in its colonies, so things like tobacco or sugar, and could sell things to its colonies that were made in Britain. The Industrial Revolution and the British Empire helped Britain to become a very rich and a powerful country in the 1800s, and railways played a very important part in this. So why were the cities of Liverpool and Manchester chosen for the route of the first railway? Well, Liverpool was one of the most important ports of the British Empire. Ships came into Liverpool from all over the world to bring things to sell in Britain, particularly materials that the factories and workshops in British cities needed to make things with. And then ships would sail from Liverpool to take the things that were made in Britain to sell in countries and cities all over the world. One of the most important materials that came into Liverpool from across the world was cotton. And that's where Manchester comes in. Manchester was the British city where most of the new factories or mills as they were called for turning raw cotton, and that was cotton picked off the plants, looks a bit like cotton wool, into cotton cloth. Cotton cloth was used for bedding, tablecloths, bags, but mainly for clothes. There was a great demand for cotton clothes in Britain and all over the world. Cotton cloth could be dyed, printed in lots of different colors. It was easy to sew and easy to dye, easy to wash. Everybody wanted cotton from ordinary people to the very rich and Manchester mills couldn't make it fast enough. Lots of the cl cotton cloth made in Manchester was shipped out through the port of Liverpool to be sold overseas. There was a dark side to this trade in cotton. A lot of the raw cotton that was shipped into Liverpool was being grown on American plantations where the work was still done by African slaves. Also, the conditions for workers in the mills of Manchester were often really bad. They were hot, deafeningly noisy, dusty, very dangerous places to work. Workers worked very long hours and a lot of the work was done by children. However, Britain's cotton industry was becoming huge and very profitable, making lots of money for some people. And Liverpool and Manchester were at the centre of it. And that is why a group of businessmen decided to pool their money to build a railway which would make transport, particularly of cotton, between Liverpool and Manchester much quicker and cheaper. And the person they chose to design and build the Liverpool to Manchester Railway was George Stevenson. George Stevenson was born into a poor family in the northeast of England. His parents were too poor to send him to school, but he managed to get work at a local coal mine. And from then on, he became interested in engines and machines. He became brilliant at improving and inventing machines until he got a reputation as one of the best engineers in Britain, particularly with regard to the new steam-powered engines that were being invented. He set up a company with his son, Robert, to make steam-powered locomotives, machines that travelled along under their own power. He'd been brought in to build the Stockton and Darlington Railway a couple of years before Liverpool to Manchester was built. And the locomotives that pulled the wagons were designed and built in his workshop. So for the businessman who put up the money, George Stevenson was the obvious choice to lead the planning and building of the Liverpool to Manchester Railway. And this is the route that was finally chosen. Have a look at the route and see if you can see any places along it that we're familiar with today. So you might have spotted 
Broad Green or Highton Prescott. You can see St. Helens. And there's Warrington, Eccles, and of course, Liverpool and Manchester at either end. The route chosen was very difficult. There were lots of major problems that George Stevenson and his team had to overcome when they were building the railway. These included Chat Moss. This was where the railway had to be built across what was virtually a swamp, and they had to find very clever ways of stopping the railway from sinking into it. Look at the picture. Can you think of any ways that this area would look different today? Well, in the 1830s, it looks very empty, doesn't it? Today, between Liverpool and Manchester, everywhere is built up. Lots of houses and factories, warehouses and roads. You can only see one house in that picture. The railway also had to cross things like streams and rivers and canals. Getting the railway across the Sankey Canal near Warrington was done by building the Sankey Viaduct, a huge bridge that carried the railway above the canal. And if you look at the picture, you can just see the train going across the Sankey Viaduct. Olive Mount. This was a massive rocky outcrop just outside Liverpool. They couldn't go around it with the railway and it was too steep to go over it. So they had to cut a huge trench, the Olive Mount cutting through the solid rock. Don't forget that this work was all done before we had modern cranes, bulldozers, earth movers and lorries. So most of the hard work was done by huge gangs of men, railway navvies they were called, and horses. It was incredibly hard work and very dangerous, as you can see from the picture. But men came from all over Britain and Ireland to work on the Liverpool to Manchester Railway. Despite all these difficulties, by 1830, the railway was finished. And there it is, the Liverpool to Manchester Railway of the 1830s. You can see the names of the stations on the map. Many of them might be familiar. Just have a look at the map and we're going to look at a 21st century a modern railway map between Liverpool and Manchester in a second and I want you to see if you can spot any of the stations from the 1830s railway that are still there in the 21st century. Okay there's the 21st century map can you spot any stations that are still stations from the 1830s? So on the 1830s railway you had stations like Edge Hill, Broad Green, Highton, Rainhill, Partycroft, Eccles. Lots of those stations are still stations today. So, by 1830, the, rain, the railway was finally finished. But at this stage, it didn't have any trains. The company came up with the idea to have a competition to choose the best type of train to use on the railway. And they called the competition the Rainhill Trials because it took place at Rainhill, one of the stations on the new railway. And to enter the competition, a train had to pull a load of three times its own weight for a distance of 70 miles at speeds of not less than 10 miles an hour. And there was a £500 prize for the train that was the winner of the trials. As you can see from the picture, it was a very exciting event. People flocked to watch the trials, possibly about 15,000 in all, we think. The crowd included top politicians from Britain and scientists and engineers from Britain, but from countries all over the world. See if you can think of the way that people, most people might have traveled to Rain Hill to watch the competition, and you might get a clue from the picture. Yeah, mostly they'd have had to come in horses and carriages or else on horseback, unless they walk there. There were four engines that finally made it into the competition. All of them were steam engines. They had coal fires which boiled water into steam and then used the steam to power the engine that made the wheels turn. Perseverance was damaged on the way to the competition. Though it ran on the sixth day, it couldn't reach 10 miles an hour and it had to be withdrawn from the trials. Sam Perret, did complete eight trips, but then it broke down and it couldn't be fixed in time to complete the trials. The last locomotive to drop out was Novelty. This was the crowd's favourite, and it reached what was then an astonishing 28 miles an hour on the first day, but it later suffered damage to a boiler pipe, 
and eventually it had to be withdrawn. The rocket was the only locomotive that completed the trials. It achieved a top speed of 30 miles an hour, pulling 13 tons in weight, and it was declared the winner of the 500 pound prize. Apparently that's equal to about 44,000 pounds today. 30 miles an hour doesn't sound fast today, but if you think that the fastest things then were horses, then you can imagine how amazing the sight of this little engine pouring out smoke and steam, thundering past, pulling its wagons, would have been to the crowd who were watching the Rainhill trials. And can you guess who the engineers were who designed and built the rocket? George Stevenson and his son Robert. And they were given the job of making the trains for the Liverpool to Manchester Railway. And there it is. You can see an original Stevenson's rocket in the Railway Museum in York. Think of how it looks different from modern trains. Well, it is smaller for one thing, and it also has that very tall chimney to take the smoke and steam away from the drivers and passengers. Two strange facts about the Rainhill trials. One of the entries was going to be a horse powered train, the cycloped. This worked a bit like a treadmill in a gym, but with the horse doing the work. Needless to say, it didn't work very well and was not able to take part in the final competition. The other strange thing was that it, the first passenger to be killed in a railway accident happened at the Rainhill trials. William Huskisson, a Liverpool politician, was a passenger on the rocket on one of its first runs in the Rainhill trials. He got out of the train at one of the stops to speak to someone. He didn't hear the train coming down the opposite track towards him, was run down and died of his injuries. So he became the first passenger to be killed in a railway accident. And you can still see a memorial to him near Liverpool's Anglican Cathedral. So the Liverpool to Manchester Railway opened and it was an instant success. Although the original idea had been for it to mainly carry cotton, more and more people wanted the railway to use the railway to travel back and forth between Liverpool and Manchester. So it became more important as a passenger railway. And because it was so successful and made lots of money for the company that built it, it led to other railways being built in Britain. So Liverpool to Manchester Railway of 1830 is often called the first modern railway. There have been some sorts of railways before, but they were just rails with wagons pulled by horses. The Liverpool to Manchester Railway was the first one that had, for example, timetables, proper carriages and proper stations. If you look at these maps, you can see that in the 10 years or so after the Liverpool to Manchester Railway opened, so in 1839, new railways were built, particularly between London and Birmingham and connecting London to the north of England. But look at the next 40 years or so, railways built all over England, Wales and Scotland. By 1852, in the middle of the Victorian period, there were more than 7,000 miles of railway in Britain. There were actually more railways then than there are today. All the major towns and cities became connected by railways and the railways changed people's lives in many ways. For example, the post became much quicker so that you could send a letter to someone at the other end of the country that would reach them in a day or so. This was really important. Don't forget that there were no phones in Victorian Britain, so you had to write letters. And if your letter had to go by horse, it could take many days to reach the person you were writing to. Newspapers were also carried by train, so people could keep up to date with the latest news instead of getting it days or weeks later. Fresh food was carried by train. People could buy food that was more fresh because it took less time to get it to markets. And there was more of a variety of food because it could be brought by, from long distances by train. But the main way that railways changed people's lives in Britain was by giving them a quick means of travel. Just like they had with the Liverpool to Manchester Railway, people all over Britain started to travel by train on the new railways that were being built. They could now travel much further, much faster, and train travel did get cheaper, becoming something that ordinary people could afford. People began to use the train to go to work, to visit their families and to go on day trips to places like the seaside, so places like Southport and Blackpool. 
This is a painting of a busy Victorian station with everyone getting ready to board the train. Can you spot how the luggage was carried on the train? Also, it looks like someone's getting arrested. Can you spot him? Most of the people look quite well to do. These are probably the nicer, more expensive carriages on the train. For poorer people, train travel could be a lot less comfortable, particularly on the earlier railways. This carriage has no roof, doesn't look like it has any seats, and everyone seems to be very rowdy. Can you spot the two men who look like they're having a punch up? So railways changed people's lives forever in Victorian Britain. And soon other countries began to build their own railways. New railways were built in France, Germany, Russia, America, India, all over the world. But the railway that led the way was the Liverpool to Manchester Railway of 1830. And of course, rail travel is still really important today. Trains are getting better and faster all the time. Look at this new train that's being developed in China. Looks very different from Stevenson's rocket and can reach speeds of 370 miles an hour. So the Liverpool to Manchester Railway and the Rainhill Trials really did help to change the world. And it all happened in the area that we live in now. One of the great things about this story is that you can still see lots of evidence of the first Liverpool to Manchester Railway around us today. So in Manchester, on the site of the Science Museum, you can still see the station and the warehouse that were built for the first Liverpool to Manchester Railway. Built by George Stevenson's team. The modern railway still follows the same route. Do you remember when we looked at the two maps earlier? And some of the bridges that were built by George Stevenson's team are still there and are still in use today, nearly 200 years later. So there's the Rainhill Station Railway Bridge, built for the 1830 Liverpool to Manchester Railway. And there's the Sankey Viaduct that we were talking about earlier. What you can't see is the Sankey Canal. The canal's gone, but the Sankey Viaduct is still there and still carries trains today. If you're in Liverpool, in Blackburn Terrace or Crown Street, look out for these buildings. They were ventilation shafts built to let clean air into the tunnel that was dug beneath the city, the first railway tunnel under any city. And that was what the railway went through before it arrived at the final station in Liverpool. I hope that you enjoyed looking at the story of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway today. If you want to test yourself about what you remember, um, we've put a little quiz together and there'll be a link after these slides so you can access a little quiz and see what you can remember of the presentation that we did today. See if you can get the answers yourself. There are also uh, links to YouTube clips that you might want to have a look at, as well as a couple of ideas for other things that you can do for a follow up. So, for example, the National Railway Museum in York has got a get very good website and there's a link to it there. Um, and you can actually watch a film clip of um, a replica of Stevenson's rocket actually running down the rail track, carrying people along the railway. Thanks again for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. Bye bye.